Hello folks and thank you for joining me. Today we're going to do a little reading on ancient religious traditions and symbols in Freemasonry. And um, first I, you know, a lot of these books I would like to get to. And I'm to the point where I have to go back and make a list of the books I've already read in the past. So I make sure I don't repeat myself on some of these. Um, and then, of course, a lot of these books, there's a lot of really good books here that are just not feasible for me to read through videos because it ends up like the Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall. It's just way too long, way too many parts. Uh, but a lot of these I do recommend. I, I think I'll make a special video a short time uh, and just go through some of these that can be recommended for a person to look up for themselves and get themselves. Um, let's go on to today's reading, which will be the 24th book read, the 24th reading. And uh, again, it's Ancient Religious Traditions and Symbols in Freemasonry. So grab your cigar and... Uh, or whatever tickles your fancy and a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or tea or whatever and we'll start with the foreword <sighs> our early operative brethren had to go to the lodge or quarry and at great cost and labor take their building materials from the original sources it was then necessary to transport them long distances to the places where they were to be used but later on, as buildings and sometimes cities gave way to the ravages of time or were destroyed by enemy invaders, their remains, scattered about the landscape or lying in shapeless piles of rubble, became convenient sources of materials from which to draw for future use. This was especially true uh, with regard to the sculptured or decorative materials which would require excessive labor and skill to reproduce if such pieces were not carried away by the conquerors as prize loot as they oftentimes were they were eagerly sought after and greatly prized by the builders in many instances when used in later temples and cathedrals such salvaged parts objects of art and adornment greatly enhance their archaeological value and serve to assist the archaeologists in piecing together history of the past and in interpreting the full meanings of the problems before him A student of research often finds himself in the same position as were these latter builders. He finds that in the ancient sources of original materials are quite worked out or are in inaccessible to him, while near at hand in the records and writing of other researchers and students is much of the information he seeks. By finding a record here and there in a column of ancient truths somewhere else, he can incorporate them into the new structure of knowledge he is building, giving, of course, full credit to the original authors by creative skill in their coordination, by reinterpretation, new and further historical truths may be brought to the light to advance the knowledge of the past in its meanings into the present and future of history. Largely in this way, research students must build and progress, and each add his contribution to the store of existing knowledge. This paper begins with the earnest effort to describe a modern basic concept of the great architect of the universe as the foundation upon which all men can agree, not necessarily agree on the language of this discourse, for each reader must think and perceive in his own language and thought, but each reader is urged to think this basic concept through his own conclusion, basing his thinking on the truth of existence and the reality of one ever-living God, so that all may build upon the same foundation and there be no division. And this is why it is a requirement of the Freemasonry that you, lead, that you believe in a deity. Um, for that common ground to be established right off the bat and and I'm 
paraphrasing here. This is not part of the book. Anyway, the next this is part of the book. The next truth that this paper hopes to show, in that from the symbolical and traditional evidence in masonry itself, is that from the beginnings of all stages of human enlightenment and knowledge, man has looked up to some superior being as the focal point of his religious perception. It is further hoped that the thoughtful reader perceived that, as the three craft degrees symbolize the three principal stages of human life, youth, man and old age. In its development, both physically and spiritually, the institution of Freemasonry has passed through these stages of development. Finally, that in speculative masonry, symbolizing the period of old age, it attains to the highest of all spiritual traditions, which is that temple not made with hands, the eternal in, heaven, in the heavens, or the spiritual temple, which also rests upon the basic foundation of eternal verity, on which all men can agree and build, and in which all men are brothers. Abundant help and inspiration have come in to the author from the works of the distinguished writers named in the bibliography appended to this work, and their assistance is greatly gratefully acknowledged. To them belongs the greater credit. Ancient Religious Traditions and Symbols in Freemasonry, a paper by Horace Sykes, member Walter F. Meyer, Lodge of Research No. 281, F&AM, Seattle, Washington, member Wallaford Lodge 267, F&AM, Seattle, Washington, the great architect of the universe, God, being the universal principle and intelligence that conceives, creates, and maintains all that is created, which creation exists only at the present moment, eliminating the need of beginning or the possibility of ending, giving a comprehensible and complete meaning to the word eternity, is omnipotent, omniscient, omniscient and omnipresent. All sentient life recognizes a supreme universal principle in proportion to the development of its intelligence, and man recognized and worshipped it in its most primitive stages of civilization. This cosmic concept not only brings God down to his creation, including man, but also lifts man up to his creator, and the relationship that is that simple and universal. Its everlasting truth and power exists in that universal simplicity. Dr. James Anderson grasped the profound, the profound simplicity of this universal truth when, in 1738, he laid down the basic tenet of masonry concerning religion as follows. I quote, "'Tis now thought more expedient only to oblige them Freemasons to that religion to which all men agree, leaving their particular views to themselves. End quote. This means to lift us up directly to the Creator, recognizing Him as such, and thus establishing the relationship of the brotherhood of man under the fatherhood of God, and most the most universal and basic concept in Freemasonry and religion. It is a concept irrevocable and everlasting, because it is God given. In view of this universal truth, it matters not whether we think of Freemasonry as religion or as just Freemasonry, nor does it affect its great mission of promoting world fraternity and brotherhood. It is an interesting fact that Freemasonry has drawn from and continues to perpetuate symbols and traditions from the ancient religions, even back to those of savagery, and also to observe that it has kept up with or led the advancement of moral concepts to the present day. The continued existence of those ancient traditions and symbols in its rituals and records is the strongest kind of evidence of the very ancient origin of masonry, its unbroken descent through many people races and tongues, its vitality in adjusting itself to an everlasting environment, and of its having lived through all of the vicissitudes and challenges that it has have opposed it. In its it is the intention in this paper to consider only those traditions and symbols that are part a part of symbolic masonry and therefore to be found in the ancient craft lodges, for only through that channel have they come in unbroken 
progression from their ancient beginnings to the present time. Tradition is really history in archaic form. The symbols are archaic calligraphy. They had their beginnings in fact or reality and always contained some kernel of truth. Their original meanings may be changed many times in wheat. They, and when they commemorate, they may be lost. And what they commemorate, somebody put weed in it, what they commemorate may be lost and forgotten, but they persist and continue to thrive until they become sacred to the past. Men carry them forward from generation to generation, almost as a spiritual heritage frequently, not knowing their origin or true significance. Now, the cornerstone or foundation ceremonies. The revered, revered, Ceremony and symbolism of the pouring of corn, wine, and oil on the newly laid cornerstone of a Masonic temple was described more than 170 years ago, or more than 100 years ago, by the Reverend George Oliver. He said, and I quote, It may be useful in this place to add a few words on the custom of scattering corn, wine, and oil, and salt on the foundation as the elements of consecration which appears to have been a custom of great antiquity. Corn, wine, and oil taken together is a symbol of prosperity and abundance and refers in this case to the anticipated success of the lodge where it has been used. In the promoting amongst its members the blessings of morality and virtue and by resulting from brotherly love, relief, and truth that society in general may profit by an infusion of the principles of masonry into every class and inducing a better feeling into the whole mass. End quote. Resistance is futile. You will be uh, simulated. Oh, sorry, that's not here. As Dr. Oliver implies, this ceremony may be a relic of a bygone age, when there was a belief that in all inanimate objects possessed a spirit or soul the same as did human beings, and that the new building must have such a soul to dwell in its foundation and walls to enliven and strengthen them, and to propitiate uh, the earth for sustaining the added weight. <laughs> Otherwise, the building could not endure. They believe the soul or spirit must be furnished by the sacrifice of a living human being who was crushed to death under the corner post or cornerstone. Such was the ancient custom and perhaps the beginning of the tradition. The human sacrifice was later superseded by animal sacrifice for which the goat was much used or the sheep. This gave and still is overseas today in certain countries for certain rituals. This gave way to the mere placing of the bones under the foundation, which was further changed to the substitution of small statuettes or figurines of humans or animals. Idolatry. Um, thou shalt not make any graven image. Anyway. I, I, I digress. The remains of such sacrifices have been found by archaeologists while excavating ancient ruins. There is evidence that vegetables also were used. Finally, we have the corn, wine, and oil of our modern Masonic ceremonies, which has long since become a sacred tradition that must go on. But how few of those who perform it realize that it was first made sacred by the sacrificing of human blood and life so that the soul of the victim could enter and enliven the building. How many of you knew that? Well, now you know. G.W. Sveth, three, writes, and I quote, and now I think it must surely be unnecessary for me to explain why we bury coins of the realm under our foundation stones. Our forefathers ages ago buried a living human sacrifice in the same place to ensure the stability of the structure. Their sons substituted an animal, their sons again a mere effigy or other symbol, and we, their children, still Im Im immure a substitute. <coughs> Excuse me. Coins. Bearing the effigy. <coughs> I got a frog in my throat all of a sudden. Um, their sons again. Uh, uh, um, okay, coins bearing the effigy impressed upon the noblest of metal. Sorry for that interruption, folks. The pure red gold uh, of the one person to whom we are most loyal and to whom we all must love. 
our gracious queen. Oh, okay. <laughs> I do not assert that one in a hundred is conscious of what he is doing. If you ask him, he will give you some different reason. But the fact remains that unconsciously we are following the custom of our fathers and symbolically providing a soul for the structure. Men continue to do what their fathers did before them, though the reasons on which their fathers acted have long been forgotten. End quote. A bearing gold says, or a period bearing gold says, and I quote, the proverb says that there is a skeleton in every man's house, and the proverb is a statement of what at one time was a fact. Every house has its skeleton, and that was, and what was more, every house was intended to have not only a skeleton, but its ghost, end quote. Jacob Grimm gives this explanation, and I quote, it was often thought a necessary, or necessity or necessary to immure live animals and even men in the foundations on which the structure was to be raised as if they were a sacrifice offered to the earth who had to bear the load upon her by this inhuman right they hoped to secure immovable stability or other advantages end quote okay and there is evidence that there's more the more ancient totemistic beliefs and practices preceded animism, but masonry does not seem to have inherited any of them. No doubt they preceded the art of building permanent structures. Uh, right? The point within the circle. After animism came the ancient religions of phallic worship or reverence for the generative, generative organs or principles or sabbatism or sabbatism I, mean, I can't say that right. Uh, for the worship of the stars, sun, stars, sun, and moon, um, Sabbatism, I would say biasism or something like that. Anyway, from phallic worship, masonry has at least one important symbol. While from Sabbatism, the Sabbatism, <laughs> I'm going to trip up over that word. There. there are several symbols and traditions which came first. It's not certain or important. So the point within the circle, which Mackey says was of phallic origin, will be considered first. It is the writer's humble opinion, however, that phallicism was not its first significance to masonry, but a later adaptation. Its origin and first use perhaps proceeded from its practical necessity as the starting point in the inscribing a circle. Ancient man in making a circle no doubt first drove a peg in the earth and then used a rod, vine, or thong in which to inscribe a circular perimeter around it uh, like a compass today. And examples of this would be the Washington Monument and uh, even uh, in the middle of the keyhole in the Vatican in Rome you had the phallic uh, obelisk set in the middle of the circle. Um, the ancient Chinese, according to their traditions, when they lived in tribes in the primeval forests of China, made meeting places in circular forms by clearing away the forest in circular areas and used that simple method to make them circular. These perhaps were their first temples, nor has this a simple but efficient method been improved even to the present day for the two points of the compass merely replace the two ends of what was used for a radius. But to come back to the ancient religious significance of the point within the circle, Albert G. Mackey says, and I quote, This is a symbol of great interest and importance, and brings us into close connection with the early symbolism of the solar orb and the universe, which was predominant in the ancient sun worship. But that, but that this was not always its symbolic significance, we may collect the true history of its connection with the phallus of the ancient mysteries. The phallus, as I have already shown under the word, was among the Egyptians a symbol of fecundity expressed by the male generative principle. It was communicated uh, from the rites of Osiris to the religious festivals of Greece. And that's exactly where it comes from, Osiris. In the story of Osiris, the, th the parts of 13 parts of the body and all that. Um, I got some words missing here. Something was going funny on me. Hold on. Shh. Let's get this here. He's, this is from the... Uh,
I do not know why it's doing that. Alright. Wow. Alright. It should be pointed out that it is the point that bears this significance, and it's because it is shown within a circle. The circle without the point has no such significance, but is a most important symbol in sun worship. That brings us to the next order of the ancient religious traditions and symbols, those connected with the Sabaeism or Sabaeism. Mackey says, and I quote again, this is written very funny, okay. The circle being a figure which returns into itself and having therefore neither beginning nor end, like the Ouroboros, uh, the snake swallowing its tail, has been adopted in the symbology of all the countries and times as a symbol sometimes of the universe and sometimes of eternity. The circle representing the disk of the sun, the radiating lines representing the rays, and these rays ending with the small representations of hands was a symbol in ancient Egypt of the one eternal creative fructifying and life-sustaining force. Of this, Savitri Devi, or Devi, says, and I quote, Shu, as an ordinary noun, we must consider as heat, or heat, and light, for the word has these meanings. In the pyramid text, Shu is the name of a god symbolizing the heat radiating from the body of Tem, or Temra, the creator of the solar disk and the end of visible trinity, Tim Shu Tifnut, and, or Tifnut, and uh, father, son, and daughter, the creator of the sun disk and the heat and moisture, the principle of fertility and its indispensable agents, whatever be therefore in the interpretation we give to the word, whether we like it as an ordinary or as a proper noun, we have to admit that the king deified the heat of the sun, or the hat and the light heat and the light. As Sir Wallace Budge himself says, and worshipped it as one eternal creative fructifying and life giving force. This permits us to assert with Sir Flinders Pitry that in the religion of the disc the object of worship was the radiant energy of the sun, of which heat and light are aspects. End quote. We have now connected the circle with perhaps the most important ancient religious symbol, the radiated circle or disc, which was the symbol of the world's first monotheism, that of Aminotep, uh, uh, the fourth, uh, or Himotep, I don't know how to pronounce that, or Akhenaten, who was the pharaoh of Egypt in 1375-1358 BC, sacrificed a world empire and was doomed to oblivion by his priest enemies in order to demonstrate the equality of all men as being created by, therefore sons of, the one only god, Aten, whose symbol was the disc and whose creative principle was the radiant energy of the sun. This should be particularly significant to all Freemasons, for there can be no other possible grounds for the brotherhood of all men than the monotheistic concept that they are the sons of the one and only God, the great architect of the universe. Ceremony of circum Circumbulation Circumambulation I always trip over that word too. The ceremony of circumambulation, meaning movement in a circular manner, is closely related to the symbol of the circle. It is also related in its origin, for it goes back to the sun worship, symbolizing, according to the belief of the ancients, the movement of the sun around the earth. It was also used in the ceremonies of the ancient mysteries, most likely with the same significance. It is not surprising, therefore, to find it perpetuated in Freemasonry. Mackey describes it as follows, and I quote, Circumamb Circumambulation is the name given by the sacred archaeologists to that religious rite in the ancient initiations which consisted in a formal procession around the altar or 
other holy and consecrated object. The same right exists in Freemasonry. The right of circumambulation undoubtedly refers to the doctrine of sun worship because circumambulation was always around the sacred place, such as the sun was supposed to move around the earth. And although the dogma of sun worship does not, of course, exist in Freemasonry, we find an allusion to it in the rite of circumambulation, which it preserves, as well as in the position of the officers of a lodge and in the symbol of a point within a circle. Dr. Oliver has somewhat different interpretation of its meaning, connecting it with it more directly in the manner of the old ancient sun worship. He writes, and I quote, The ancients made it a constant practice to turn themselves around when they worshipped the gods. By this circular motion, says Plutarch, some imagined that they intended to in imitate the motion of the earth, but I am rather of the opinion that the precept is grounded on another notion, that as all temples are built fronting the east, the people, at their entrance, turn their backs to the sun, and consequently, in order to uh, fa face the sun, they were obliged to make half a turn to the right, and then, in order to place themselves before the deity, they completed the round in offering up their prayers." End quote. The Blazing Star. The Blazing Star is one of the most conspicuous and essential emblems of the modern Masonic Lodge, but its use or meaning, if any, in ancient operative masonry is not known, nor is there any certainty when it was first used or from where it derived. And James Anderson does not mention it in his uh, the Constitutions of Freemasons in 1723, end quote. But in his revised New Book of Constitutions, 1738, he mentions the Blazing Star as a part of the furniture of a lodge. In a lecture by Dunkerley, which was adopted by the Grand Lodge of England, the Blazing Star was said to represent, and I quote, the star that guided the wise men of Bethlehem, proclaiming to mankind the nativity, and there conducting our spiritual progress to the author of our redemption, end quote. Preston associates the blazing star with, quote, Moses receiving the tablets of the law on the Mount Sinai, and with God's constant watchfulness. And that don't even make sense. That's the the eye of providence um, which is also known as the all-seeing eye or uh, eye of Horus and it does have the blazing rays around it but anyway Webb, in his lectures, which have been generally adopted in the United States, follows the teachings of Dunkerley as it to being the star of Bethlehem, which guided the wise man. Later, this explanation was omitted from the lectures by the Baltimore Convention in 1843 as being too Christian and therefore sectarian. sectarian. In Hutchinson's system, the blazing star was considered a symbol of prudence, and so explained, and the Dunkerley explanation of its being a star of Bethlehem was also adopted, but as a secondary symbol. In the lectures, as revised by Rev. Dr. Samuel Hemming and adopted by the United Grand Lodge of England at the Union of 1813, is found the following definition, and I quote, The blazing star of glory in the center refers to the sun, which lightens the earth with its refulgent rays, dispensing its blessings to mankind at large and giving life to all things here below. End quote. It is interesting to point out in the revision of Dr. Hemming, which now constitutes the basis of the authorized lectures of the Grenada Grand Lodge of England, how very closely this explanation of the blazing star fits the monotheistic religion of the disc, or sun, as conceived and taught by Akhenaten in ancient Egypt. In fact, Hemming's language could almost pass for a translation translation from the pyramid text. It appears quite consistent to trace the blazing star to an origin in Sabasim or star worship, where there we can associate it with the worship of Mars, which was anciently observed by most of the Semitic peoples of the East under that and other names, as we now know, Mars is a planet that shines only by the reflected light of the sun, which is 
this, but this they did not know then. So it and the other planets were called wandering stars, as distinguished from the fixed stars, and were considered worthy of special reverence. A probable source of the blazing star, however, is the more ancient Egyptian worship of the dog star Sirius, because by its heliacal rise, heliacal rising, or emerging from the sun's rays, so as to become visible, it warned the people of the approaching danger of the pirate periodical rising of the Nile River. I didn't know it had anything to do with the rising of the Nile River, but anyway, that's interesting. According to John Fellows, in his Exposition of the Mysteries, the dog star Sirius, the Anubis of the Egyptians, is the blazing star of masonry. This would make it a symbol of one of the Egyptian gods, although Oliver, who was inclined towards Christian interpretations, sees God symbolized in masonry by the blazing star as a herald of our salvation. It appears that the original Masonic blazing star was one with five waving points, representing flame, which would seem to be the more appropriate emblem. In view of all this, it seems that there is no symbol which has been so much of a football to be kicked around and out and back in again by the succession of lecture writers and revisers as it has been the blazing star. Indeed, all of this has taken place in the period of modern Freemasonry, and we might therefore find greater satisfaction by adhering to the ancient sources for its origin and explanation. The triangle radiated. The triangle radiated is another ancient symbol of the sun god, referring to its light and radiant energy. Its meaning in masonry has not been changed, but somewhat modified to bring it into line with modern thought. It is described by Mackey as follows, and I quote, The triangle placed within and surrounded by a circle of rays is called, in Christian art, a glory. When this glory is distinct from the triangle, it surrounds it in the form of a circle. It is then an emblem of God's eternal glory. This is the usual form in religious uses. But when, as is most usual in the Masonic symbol, the rays emanate from the center of the triangle and, as it were, enshroud it in their brilliance, it is symbolic of the divining light, or it's supposed to say divining light. Even though it says diving light, it's supposed to say divining light. And per, uh, the perverted idea of the pagans referred these rays of light to their sun god and their Sabian worship. Um, but the true Masonic idea of the glory is that it symbolizes the eternal light of wisdom, which surrounds the supreme architect as a sea of glory, and from him as a common center emanates to the universe of his creation. End quote. The all-seeing eye, the monotheistic concept in masonry of the great architect of the universe is forcefully manifested in the symbolism of the all-seeing eye. This powerful symbol, which constantly searches the soul and looks into the heart of every, every mason, is a reminder of the omnipresence of God and of his omnipotence which sustains, regulates, and coordinates everything from the smallest atom of the universe to the largest and most distant galaxy of suns in that perfect rhythm of celestial harmony that the or origin of sight or the organ of sight and the beholder of light should have been chosen as the emblem or the organ of sight so it did mean to say that the organ of sight in other words the eye the beholder of light should have been chosen as the emblem of this powerful symbol is most natural. So far as is known, it was used most anciently by the Egyptians in their mysteries and hieroglyphic recordings. It was also known and used by the Hebrews. Again, referring to Mackey, we find, and I quote, the all-seeing eye, an important symbol of the supreme being, borrowed by the Freemasons from the nations of antiquity, both the Hebrews and Egyptians appear to have derived its use from the natural inclination of figurative minds to select an organ as the symbol of function which it is intended peculiarly to discharge. On the same principle, the Egyptians represented, oh, uh, uh, 
to the Egyptians. It represented Osiris, their chief deity, by the symbol of an open eye, placed this hieroglyphic of him in all their temples. And his symbolic name on the monuments was represented by the eye accompanying a throne, to which was sometimes added abbreviated figure of the god, and sometimes what was has been called a hatchet, but which may as correctly be supposed to be a representative representation of a square. Um, the all-seeing eye may then be considered as a symbol of God manifested in his omnipresence, his guardian and preserving character, to which Solomon alludes in the book of Proverbs when he says, the eyes of, and I quote, and the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. It is a symbol of the omnipotent deity, end quote. And uh, back here, I don't know this author, uh, Mackey, and of course I need to add this because now we know and it's represent actually represented Horus, not Osiris, and uh, that's why it's called the Eye of Horus. But we also now know that it is also a cut diagram of uh, the pineal gland, gland and the whole uh, hypothalamus system in your in your brain is uh, you can you can see this in diagrams and stuff uh, I think I put it in some videos before even just as pictures um, I know I have um, but it's the it's the uh, pineal gland and all that is what the eye horus really is it's a cross-section of your that part of your brain and all right so I, I move forward here the 47th problem of Euclid it may be surprising to many readers to learn that the 47th problem of Euclid for which Py, uh, Pythagoras uh, Pythagoras you know Pythagoras whatever the fuck <laughs> is noted uh, all right Pythagoras all right everybody agrees with that one anyway did not originate with him but did originate with a much at a much earlier time and from an ancient religious formula connected with the worship of Osiris and Isis and their offspring Horus. Of it, Mackey says, and I quote, the right angle triangle is another form of the triangle which deserves attention. Among the Egyptians, it was a symbol of universal nature. The base representing Osiris or the male principle, the perpendicular Isis or the female principle, and the hyp uh, hypotenuse probably not pronouncing that right, Horus, their son, or the product of the male and female principles. This symbol was received by Pythagoras from the Egyptians during his long sojourn in that company, the country, company, uh, that corporation. Now, um, with it, he also learned the particular property it possessed, namely that the sum of the squares of the two shorter sides is equal to the square of the longest side, symbolically expressed by the formula that the product of Osiris and Isis is Horus. This figure has been adopted in the third degree of masonry and will be there recognized as the 47th problem of Euclid. The uh, altar masonry and, and this is where i should in this is where i should put in uh you know uh, here in fact let's do that real quick i can do that i think i can do that in this video here's what we're gonna look we're gonna look uh i of horus all right real quick Yahoo, why is it searching Yahoo? That's insane. I don't ever search Yahoo. I don't know why that was set on Yahoo search. Anyway, there's the eye of the horse. Um, now in Freemasonry, if you want to look up the eye in Freemasonry, I will look, I'll show you in a minute. It's eye of providence. Um, I'm trying to see if they show in this a cut rate of what I'm telling you about uh, not that you haven't probably seen it before most of my readers here um, they don't show the cut rate but this right here is your pineal gland you have your hypothalamus that comes down here and your other uh, in, in doc, endocrine system uh, glands and it's the cut side uh, there it is right there 
Okay, you see this picture right here. Here you have the eye. Here you have the eye. This is your pineal gland. You have the glands inside your brain at the base of your skull brain. <laughs> All right, so there's that. Now the um, just to show you the difference in what we're talking about here. Eye of Providence, which is the Freemason Eye. Here. Right here on the dollar bill, your Freemasonry Eye. You see these different pictures here. Like that. This is your Eye of Providence. That's how you look that up. And, uh, okay, and then this one, the altar, what we was talking about, oh, the 40, the problem of Euclid, I wanted to show you that because it's not really a triangle. I, he does a terrible job of explaining it there. The 47th problem of Euclid is actually a sign, a uh, symbol used in science today. Um, Forty seventh problem of Euclid. I know this isn't our usual format that we do this, but I'm, I feel like I need to show people exactly what we're talking about here in this particular reading to help kind of because of the way I was reading it, the reason I was reading it. So they'll probably show it here on Wikipedia. There's Masonic Wiki. Maybe I should went to that. Anyway, the, the Pythagorean theorem on uh, there. And here we have the, right here. This triangle here is the triangle in the middle of the three squares. And the three squares can be aligned in many different ways. But this is the way you see them most of the time. Is with the big square here, another square, another square. And then the triangle that you're talking about is this triangle in the middle. Okay. So hopefully everybody can see that. And we'll move on with the altar. The altar is the next part here. Masonry has one heritage in particular traceable in part to the old Hebrew religion. This is the altar in various forms, sometimes adorned with horns or spurs on the four corners. In W.R. Fulbright's Archaeology of Palestine, Plate 19 is shown six illustrations of the house altars with horns on corners which were unearthed in the excavation of ancient uh, Megiddo, or Megiddo in Palestine from horizons between the 10th and 9th century BC. He describes them as cuboid limestone altars of incense standing on four short legs with shallow troughs on top, the sides elaborately decorated with incised geometrical patterns and rude drawings of desert flora and fauna including especially palm trees, camels, wild goats, antelope, wild asses, these or donkeys. These may be reasonably uh, may reasonably be considered to uh, be actual specimens of the ancient altars which M Mackey describes as follows. And I quote in the Jewish temple, the altars of burnt offering and incense had each at the four corners horns of shittim sh wood um, among the Jews, as well as other ancient peoples, the altar was considered peculiarly holy and privileged, and hence, when a criminal fleeing took hold of the horns, he found an asylum in safety. And as the Masonic altar is a representation of the altar of the, Sol 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 the Solomonic member, it should be constructed with these horns. Okay. Uh, Solomonic meaning the you know Solomon. Uh, elsewhere on the same uh, subject, Mackey also observes, and I quote again: "Among the ancients, the altar was always invested with a peculiar sanctity. 
Um, altars were places of refuge, and the supplicants who fled to them were considered as having placed themselves under the protection of the deity to whom the altar was consecrated, and to do violence even to slaves and criminals at the altar or drag them from it was regarded as an act of violence to the deity himself and hence a sacrilegious crime. From all this we see that the altar in masonry was not merely a convenient article of furniture intended like a table to hold a Bible. It is a sacred utensil of religion intended like the altars of the ancient temples for religious uses and thus identifying masonry by its necessary existence in our lodges as a religious institution. Its presence should also lead the contemplative mason to view the ceremonies in which it is employed with solemn reverence as being part of a really religious worship. The Year of Masonry it is not exactly clear just when or by whom the use of Anno Lucis, indicating the year of masonry or the year of light, has begun. Uh, but the idea seems to have started when James Anderson dated his first constitutions in this way. And again, Mackey gives us information concerning it. And I quote, the year of masonry, sometimes used as synonymous with the year of light in the 18th century, it was in fact the more frequent expression, year of light, A-L, is the epoch used in Masonic documents of the symbolic degrees. This era is calculated from the creation of the world and is obtained by adding 4,000 to the current year on the supposition that Christ was born 4,000 years after the creation of the world. The Legend of Hiram Abiff The symbolism of Hiram Abiff originated with Masonic legend. Hiram played a major role in the symbology of that legend, not only as chief architect and artificer of the work, but as the Masonic embodiment of that high moral standard towards which all men strive or should strive anyway. <laughs> In addition, his importance rises to its supreme height as a symbol of the first magnitude. In its interpretation in speculative masonry, where its significance seems to stem from the Christian religion and Hiram, in his death, burial, and resurrection becomes a symbol of the Redeemer of men. Okay. Um, I thought Christ was the one that was, but okay. <laughs> and in, of course Albert Pike supports this uh, interpretation and he writes the murder of Hiram his barrow and his being raised again by the master are symbols both of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Redeemer and of the death and burial and sins of the natural man and his being raised again to a new life or born again by the direct action of the Redeemer after morality had failed to raise him that of the lion of the house of Judah is the strong grip, never to be broken, with which Christ and the, the royal line of that house has clasped to himself the whole human race and embraces them in his wide arms as closely and affectionately as brethren embrace each other on the five points of fellowship. End quote. The two saints John, another tradition of Christian origin to be adopted by Freemasons, one that became of very great importance to them in establishing feast days, meeting days, and otherwise, was that of the two saints John. It is significant that the date on which the Grand Lodge of Ignan England was formed in 1717 was the feast day of St. John the Baptist. This may have been a coincidence, yet can by thought of as by design, uh, yet can be by thought of as by design, and probably was by design and purpose, in order that the infant Grand Lodge might draw inspiration and strength from this courageous and godly personage. The annual feast of the new Grand Lodge was therefore after, thereafter observed on that date until the year 1725, when it was changed to St. John the Evangelist Day perhaps because the latter came on a more convenient date for the annual election and other year in business. The tradition of these two patron saints is deeply woven into the 
fabric of speculative masonry and should wield an ever-increasing influence on its spiritual character and fraternal progress of the two saints john mackey says and i quote saint john the baptist one of the patron saints of freemasonry and at one time indeed the only one of the name of saint john the evangelist having been introduced subsequent to the 16th century his festival occurs on the 24th of june and is very generally celebrated by the masonic fraternity it is interesting to note that the grand lodge of england was formed on saint john baptist day in 1717 and that the annual feast was kept on that day until 1725 when it was held for the first time on the festival of the evangelist laurie says that the scottish masons always kept the festival of the baptist until 1737 when the grand lodge changed the time to the annual election to saint andrew's day saint john the evangelist one of the patron saints of freemasonry whose festival is celebrated on the 27th of December, his constant admonition in his epistles to the cultivation of brotherly love and the mystical nature of his apocalyptic visions have been perhaps the principal reason for the veneration paid to him by the craft. End quote. <clears throat> the letter G. Conspicuous symbol so prominent in the Masonic furnishings and adornments. The capital letter G is of uncertain origin and of a comparatively late date. It is given two widely varying interpretations, both highly important in their Masonic significance. The first interpretation inclines strongly to the operative science of the craft, while the other inclines towards the speculative side, or Freemasonry. Its usefulness and importance are not known to be measured by the comparatively short time it has been known, but rather because it is one of the more conspicuous and compelling of the visual symbols and is highly stimulating to the imagination. It is because of these qualities, no doubt, that it is so extensively used, not only as lodge room adornment, but also as personal jewelry insignia of its history and interpretations. Mackey comments, and I quote, there is an uncertainty as to the exact time when this symbol was first introduced into speculative masonry. It was not derived in its present form from the operative masons of the Middle Ages who bestowed upon Freemasonry so much of its symbolism, for it is not found among the architectural decorations of the old cathedrals. Hutchinson, who wrote as early as 1776 in his Spirit of Masonry, says, It is now incumbent on me to demonstrate to you the great signification of the letter G, wherewith lodges and the metals of masons are ornamented. To apply its signification to the name of God only is depriving it of part of its Masonic import, although I have already shown that the symbols used in the lodges are impressive of the divinities being the great object of masonry as architect of the world. This significant letter denotes geometry, which to artificers is the science by which all their labors are calculated and formed, and to masons contains the determination, definition, and proof of the order, beauty, and wonderful wisdom of the power of God in his creation. Okay, they cut it short here. In masonry, there is a different definition of the letter G given at each new uh, degree from the first to third degree and then again at the 14th degree and then again at the 32nd and 33rd degrees. Uh, there are different uh, interwoven interpretations of the letter G. And it includes everything from the first ones you learn of, of God and geometry. And, of course, the geometry not only that the Freemasons use, but the architect of the world. They are well aware that this is a mathematical construct. Uh, everything is based off of mathematics. And uh, anyway, so I, I'll move on here. They should have said a lot more about G, I think. But we'll run into that in other books. King Solomon's Temple. 
The symbolism of King Solomon's temple in Freemasonry is so completely established and well known that it need not be enlar enlarged upon here. In fact, more than the volume of this entire paper could be written about the interpretations of each sign, symbol, and tradition. As for the succeeding generations of Masons who have studied and lived their meanings through the exercise of their imaginations and experiences, have added something of their own to the already growing volume of meanings. Ever-expanding changes still go on and thus symbolism and tradition live on, increasing in vitality and adapting to as well as conditioning to the evolution of thought, customs, and religions, and will continue to do so as long as man is constituted an imaginative and creative being. The symbolism of King Solomon's temple is embodied in the fact that it is and has been the source of inspiration for the origin of that highest of all spiritual traditions in the craft, the tradition of that spiritual building, that house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, which all Freemasons are dedicated to build, both in and out and of themselves. All Freemasons are constituted builders in a spiritual temple, and they labor to perfect and lay each day's ashlar more perfectly than the one before. It is a sacred tradition put into practice that ultimately lifts man towards God, his creator, and thus giving the final divine purpose to life and making Freemasonry worthy of the seal of divine approval. My brother, when you were raised to the sublime degree of a master mason, when the last cable toe was removed and you were accepted to full brotherhood as a free and accepted mason and competent craftsman and builder, did you enter and start labor on that spiritual temple? Did you make the foundation sacrifice that all good brothers have made before you? Symbolically speaking, did you place your bones and mortal parts under the foundation stones in order that your immortal self and parts might enter into the walls of the spiritual temple and strengthen them? And did you take up your tools as a master mason and go forward as a master craftsman to help build and complete the structure? finishing each day's labor more perfectly than the last, shaping each stone with greater exactness and beauty, placing and cementing it with a high quality of brotherly love. These are the qualities of your craftsmanship that will add more strength and greater beauty to your spiritual temple. Rest assured that if you have worked assiduously in that way to improve your craftsmanship, when the last keystones have been placed in the arches of the domes, and when the glittering spires have been completed and you shall have finally reached the top, then the divine Grand Master will be there with the level and square to check the laying of the caps, capestone or capstone, and to put his seal of approval upon your masterpiece and to pay you the wages in full for your labors. And the references are listed here. I'll just, I'm not going to read them. Uh, you can see them. Uh, various pieces. And this was from a Walter F. Meyer Lodge of Research, number 281 FAMM, in Seattle, Washington, on September of 1956. And I thank you for joining me.